If you have your Bibles with you tonight, let's open them to the book of Numbers. All right, so Numbers chapter 25 tonight. Numbers chapter 25. We'll pick up on the context after we jump into the text. Verse 1. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot. Now they're still there in the valley of Moab, right there at the door to the promised land. And they've begun now to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab, for they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. That means the Moabites invited them to their worship time. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods, so Israel joined themselves to Baal. Remember, Balak's god was Baal. We're going to see that way too many times. But to Baal of Peor. And the Lord was, of course, angry against Israel. Let me pray. Father, um, we know you have a righteous anger. And you have a right to that anger. Um, And Father, sin and rebellion angers your hearts. Your heart, I mean. Because you know, Lord, that it destroys our lives. It's, it's, it's a joining in the league with Satan to walk and to give ourselves to rebellion against you. And uh, Father, I know it breaks your heart, Lord, to see anybody who knows you or sees you and, Lord, to turn from you. So we pray, Father, that you would teach us, Lord, through Israel tonight. And uh, we want to feel your heart and know your heart and also, Lord, have a heart after you as well. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we were uh, applauding Israel. They'd come up there, remember, the Lord had circled them back around, and, and through Moses, they were stepping out in faith, and they went out to defeat these nations that surrounded them. And, and as they were doing that, the Lord uh, gave them victory, didn't he? So here they've conquered a bunch of the peoples in the area that they live in. Uh, that they're living in. He's got them there in the valley, right there at the door. And with that, we'll see that they also started to acquire some things. They acquired a lot of their, um, they didn't wipe out everything as we'll see, but they also began to uh, take over that, their homes and their things that were left there and began to settle there in the valley. But with that, uh, God has not removed the Moabites yet, and um, so they were drawn in or enticed by them. So these are the people that God has brought them to the land to wipe out. There's great judgment because of the evil of this people. Evil is proliferates, doesn't it? And it becomes so much so within groups of people that you can just about feel the evil. Their hearts are so buried in wickedness. And that's really what the land is full of. And I know sometimes, um, again, we can just sense that when you walk into maybe even cities that are given over to evil and or even neighborhoods that way, you sense that darkness. And so Satan is working. He's already trying to pull them into that same darkness. They're set apart under the Lord. He's in the middle of their camp. And so last week we saw that um, this, this man, Balak, who's the king of Moab, he knew he couldn't defeat Israel because he saw the greatness of, of the God of Israel. But he thought, well, but if I could get somebody to curse them or to get God to curse them, then that's the only way uh, we can get at him. So we likened him to Satan. He's looking for an angle. And he was trying to get an angle. And he was using Balaam, who was the prophet of God, a guy that speaks to God. And he did speak to God. And he said, I'm going to acquire him and, and say, listen, I want you to curse Israel. Connect with their God and curse Israel. So He's looking for every angle to do that. But what did God do? God told Balaam, listen, you're not going to curse. You're only going to bless. And so God began to give him blessings, not cursings uh, for them. So in Numbers 23, um, it 
it says here, he has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble or wickedness in Israel. And that's kind of one of the things that Balaam said. What does that mean? Let me just explain it here that um, it wasn't that God couldn't see their wickedness. Is that he chose in spite, instead of that to bring a blessing to them. It wasn't that God didn't know the hearts of Israel. He knew that there are some that are getting ready to rebel against him. But he chose rather to bring blessing there instead of cursing. It wasn't that he couldn't see it or didn't know it. But um, one of the verses says, um, he is with them. He is for them like the horns of a wild ox. I say, what? Well, he's referencing the horns of a wild ox, how a wild ox will use those horns to push and just to shove anybody anywhere. And, and it was like God saying he's for them and he's pushing them along instead of cursing them. He's pushing them, and we'll see that, trying to push them toward their uh, obedience instead of disobedience and getting them into the, the promises that he is uh, um, wanting to bless them with. And that's kind of the nature of our God. He's, he's, um, he's not looking for a, a, an opportunity to curse us, is he? He wants to bless us. And he was looking on them graciously. Um, you have to almost force God to do that. You got to work hard in your rebellion to him there. Because in order to go to hell, a man is going to have to walk over God's son. You're going to have to trample over his love for you, his desire to call you, woo you, convict you. You know, as an unbeliever, you have to jump a lot through a lot of hurdles to let your heart go way down into wickedness. And God's calling you. You know that's not right. You know you shouldn't do that. And so that's the nature of the Lord. He doesn't want to curse. He wants to bless. And in 2 Peter you know, we see here that um, men are going to kind of start to mock God in the last days, and they're going to mock the word of God and say, well, we've heard about this judgment that God's going to bring, you know. He's, you know, we don't believe it. He's never going to bring it. And Peter said, no, don't mistake his reluctance or his slowness to bring this judgment uh, to, to say that he'll never bring it because he will bring it. Remember the floods. Right Now, he waited with them for over a thousand years, and that wickedness continued to grow. And finally, they forced God to bring that judgment. But he says the same thing here. He says, the Lord's not slow about his promise to judge or curse, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He waited 430 years to bring this judgment upon these people. Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites. That's a long time. How long would he put up with a wicked nation? Well, I think we should start thinking about that, shouldn't we? Because we've become one. We're a nation that openly defies God and the laws of God and the nature of God, and, and it's increasingly uh, defiant against him and wicked. But uh, you look at the Lord, and you're thankful that he's kind and gracious because he gave us time, Amen to be saved. But that's the nature of it. So he didn't want to do this and he didn't want to bring judgment, but now the people are just openly going toward wickedness. That's Israel. And so we're going to look in a minute at how this came to be, but it makes your heart sick to think of um, how these men who had been through all of this journey watching the faithfulness of the Lord every day to give them food, to bring them water, to sustain them, to show his light and his love. And in the face of all that, they do open wickedness to him. They betray him. They, they play the harlot. And that really means in, in that way, not only sexually, they were you know, entering into the daughters of Moab, but also uh, spiritually, they were playing the harlot. They were they were um, drawing their hearts away from the living God to these false gods for the sake of their flesh. And so it breaks the Lord's heart. So um, these women of Moab kind of came out and enticed the men. 
and began to draw them in. And pretty soon, again, fornication began to happen there. And then, you know, this openness to say, well, come over. We're having a worship, you know, a time here. We're praying to our gods. And, of course, their hearts began to betray, again, you know, the Lord. Now, we're not talking about, I don't know that they're saved. Because salvation comes through Christ, obviously, but it comes through faith. We're, we're, we're saved by grace through faith. And, and like Abraham, he wasn't saved through his works. He was saved by faith in the Lord. And I don't know where all of Israel is. Obviously, a lot of them are pretty wicked still. You'd think we might have weeded them all out by now, you know? We'd have enough of the ground opening and get rid of all the wicked. But they just seem to keep coming here. And so, um, but the Lord doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, does he, or in this judgment, but he will judge. It's hard to believe that men would be so defiant. I mean, they know what is promised to them if they do it, and they do it anyway. The progressiveness of sin brings more and more defiance. I want to show you that, but let's go to verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord. You say, why would God do such a thing and bring such great judgment? And they forced him to do it. They're just openly mocking him as God. And there's no hope for you if you do that. And God says, listen, I want to stem the tide of this kind of evil before it begins to spread like it has to the other nations. And so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you slay his men who have joined, married themselves to Baal of Peor. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman. So Um, It says, in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, while they were weeping at the door of the tent of meeting. Can you imagine the timing on that? They had just got done executing, as we'll see, I think 24,000 people slain, put to death. And in sheer arrogance... One more guy comes walking in from outside the camp, and he walks up, and he walks right past Moses. Hey, Moses. Got his arm around a Midianite woman, and he's taking her to his his family to get the blessing from his family. Can you imagine the arrogance of that guy? Sees right there in front of Moses, just walks right by doing this great evil that All of these people had just died openly, open air and broad daylight. When Phinehas, the son, verse 7, of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, when he saw this, it's the grandson of Aaron, he arose from the midst of the congregation. He took a spear in his hand and he went after the man of Israel and he chased him down into his, his tent and he pierced both of them. Uh, through the man of Israel and the woman through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked or stopped. Um, I don't think we always think of sin as being um, so defiant, but it can become defiant. Not all sin is just an open desire to just defy the living God. But it can become like that. It's progressive in its heart, in its attitude. And we we are seeing it in our generation. We're watching it. The progression of it. And you can see it in a whole group of people. You can watch the progression. Let me me turn us here to Romans. You know the story. You know the the chapter. But God explains what's happening all over the earth with men as they launch out into sin. It says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, because they, they rejected the saying, I will not serve you, I will not obey you, and I'll walk in my own truth and my own light, right? So God gave them over to a depraved mind. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, this fills their life with being unrighteous, wickedness, greed, 
and then just pure evil. They become haters of God. Not just not followers of God, but they hate him. Haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, to the point where they want to invent even more evil, right? And he says, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, means they already acknowledge, they know what they're doing. They know they're defying the God who created them. They not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Now, you can just picture that guy walking by wanting to get his approval from the rest of his family about his wickedness. I mean, how many times did God told them, don't take their gods, don't take their people, don't go into their, uh, their women. You are called and you're going to be called to wipe that out. I don't want to see it anymore. And he's not only going to say, uh, this guy's not only saying, no, not only will you see it, God, I'm going to put it in your face, right? That's that kind of an attitude of sin. Once a nation, think about it for just a second. Once a nation begins to allow open demonstrations of immorality, fornication, you know, we went through that in the 60s. It was now, it was now, um, not only popular, but it was just this idea of this was just a great thing for us to just have free sex, right? Adultery, and then of course progressed homosexuality in the culture uh, being embraced. Then there really became a hatred and defiance toward God that arose out of that with atheism and agnosticism. And you see all of that humanism um, and the worship of all kinds of gods that flooded into America as well, um, even more so than it had ever been. Now, once a society does that, will that society be able to contain or restrain those evil practices? Once you let it out, how do you get it back in? How do you stop it? Now, God's going to kill them all. <laughs> you know, we can't kill people. God hasn't called us to kill people, and that's not the answer, especially within the church. Uh, we're not here to do any of that. God's the one who brings judgment. We just love the sinner. We preach the gospel, and we'll explain that in a minute. But, but what do you do? What does a society do? They won't even call it sin anymore, right? So how long will it take until that spreads toward the rest of the families in that nation? How long does it come uh, uh, take until it's just in inbred inside of our culture and in all of our families and we see all of our families see the cost of that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty old. Um, old enough to um, go back on TV now and I'm, and I'm watching because um, it's just like the only thing I feel like I really enjoy is like Bonanza, you know. And then those old gun smoke, now, I don't know if it's gun smoke, but whatever, the, the big valley or whatever it is. And here's what I, I find refreshing. There's a sense of right and wrong. There's a sense of honor. There's a sense of chastity. There's a sense of, you know, all of those things are portrayed there still in our culture. And that was probably a little old then when they made them. And I think the probably 60s, 70s, probably 70s. Um, but either way, there was still that sense there, which is long gone from our society again. But, but now you replace that with today's sitcoms, and that's, there's no shame, no anything. In fact, it's celebrated, lauded, all of it, our own wickedness or defiance of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, if you allow that to go unchecked, what comes next? We, sh we should be thinking about what comes next. What does come next? How long will it be before the people, um, again, we're no, no longer able to contain the foundation of truth in the country anymore? Because now it's been eroded, right? It's gone. There's no morals. It's an amoral society. And so you're not able to really proclaim these morals without you know, being looked down upon uh, it, it, within that society. But more than that, um, um, the same people 
that used to be ashamed in their sin are no longer ashamed of the sin, but they're outwardly and brazenly, they flaunt and promote their sin, right? And there's an arrogance that goes on, a boastfulness, and you see that rising within the society, but we're going past that. What happens there, you know, because of the apathy of the godly in this country, we didn't take much of a stand at all against any of that tide, um, and, and so it's gone. So what's the end of such a society? What, what ends up happening? Well, it's the, what happened to the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Jebusites? They, begree, they begin to bring judgment upon the righteous, calling the righteous evil, hateful, ignorant, bigots, whatever it is. It isn't that, that they now say, no, we have a platform to do what we want to do. That's not enough. We want to shame the other side. And to, uh, again, it becomes increasingly demonstrative, doesn't it? And now you, you see not only you know, what happens as you hold your values your stance in Christ and you proclaim your values uh, uh, you know, uh, um, of right and wrong there. You're not only shamed there, but what happens past that? What's the next step? Because we're already there. The next step is a physical reaction. The world has known it. <laughs> we just haven't known it in America. But be a missionary a lot of places around the world. And you're not just... Uh, afraid that somebody might not like you when you share the gospel, you have to be concerned with being put in prison by the government for doing that, or jailed, or killed, or beaten, or whatever it is. Look even at some of the New Testament church when those societies began to get there. Um, they just said, you need to expect that. Well, we're so far from that that if that even happened to some of us, we're like, well, I'm not serving the Lord anymore. Look what, look what they did to me, you know? First beating we take, right? So you have to settle in here and you have to see the progression. And I think it's amazing to me that this is America 2017. We see the same kind of arrogance and same kind of hatred there. And it's a strong, um, we call it more like a liberal uh, mentality, but it really just means We've been liberated from God, and we'll do whatever we want to do. But now, again, it becomes deeper. That was 50 years ago, and then, I mean, 20 years ago, and then even look in the last 10 years. It's just overwhelming us. So, verse 9. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord, that's a lot. How do you find 24,000 people willing to be openly defiant to God and to go off and to do exactly what he said after they've watched all these other people be judged for their defiance against God. That's, uh, again, the brazenness of our sinfulness and the really Satan's luring of us into that sin, and pretty soon we are so um, overwhelmed in that sin. Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, of course his grandson, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy. He, he saw things the way I see things. He looked at that situation exactly the way I looked at that situation. But it's sad to think of how many people didn't see it that way. You know, we can lose our perspective of the, you know, the cost of sin the grievousness of sin. Now, we always love the sinner for us because that's the effect of sin. And so I'm not saying that uh, obviously this is, an old, this is God being able to say, judge this. God gets to judge it. And he'll judge all of us, of course. He gets to be the judge of that. But to have this same heart and to see things the way he sees things. You know, we could watch TV, <laughs> TV, but you could watch some of these programs, you know, from My Three Sons or whatever it was, and then, you know, um, of course, you 
didn't have to be offended by all of these things. And then, but if you watch things today, there's been a slow progression. And now if you even stopped and said, you know, what are they doing on that show? What are they promoting on that show? What, are, what, what values are they promoting? What are they showing me on there? Um, but, but we can get so kind of numbed down that it doesn't even affect us anymore. We can just watch it and watch adultery, fornication, just whatever things there. And we, we can almost just go, oh, that's, they're in love, right? You, they, may, they can even get you into that so much that you're just going, <laughs> they just love each other so much, you know? And you begin to see it in a, in a wrong way there. Um, um, but what does it do? It breaks homes, it breaks lives, it breaks the culture down. It, you know, we see the consequences all around us, but that's the allurement of it. If you just look at it slowly, you don't see it this way. But Phineas said, no, I see it, God. I see exactly what it is. It's open defiance against you. It's a hatred towards you. It's a mocking of who you are as the God who created us and made us. And he says, therefore, say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace, verse 12, and it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of perpetual priesthood. The line's going to go down to the grandson, and then through Phineas, that line of Aaron is going to go from him. Not from the other, necessarily the other ones, but specifically from Phineas. The high priesthood uh, will be moving that uh, direction. And uh, a covenant of perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. That's what God wants his priests to be like. Passionate, zealous, to not, not to have this, you know, um, uh, just apathy toward evil and wickedness that's all around. Now, let me just let me just say a couple things on that because I want to make sure that we understand this. What does zeal for the Lord look like in our New Testament world? So I, want to, I don't want to mix the Old Testament or the New Testament. So in the New Testament, say we're saying, I'm zealous for you, God. I want to live for you. I want to obey you. I want my life to be pleasing to you. I don't want to walk in open rebellion to you. I want your, you to be, you know, Pleased with my life, Lord. And you're pursuing that with all of your heart, okay? Then what does that look like? Two things, I think, happen. Two things. To the world, you desire to preach the gospel. That's where zealousness shows up. If you don't want to save your neighbor who doesn't know the Lord, you're not, you're not very zealous for the Lord, right? Now, I don't mean you're obnoxious or, you know, just berating your neighbor, but you're praying for that neighbor. You're looking for the opportunity to share the hope because you know he's perishing, right? That's the zealousness. You see the sin and you see what is happening in his life and you want to see him come out of that. The Bible says we're to love our enemies, do good to those who despitefully use us. So that's our attitude toward the world. Uh, but our eyes should be zealous there. And, and really, I know the measurement of where I am in my walk with the Lord with how aware I am of who's saved and who's lost around me, right? And uh, again, I, I wish I could always say, boy, I'm always passionate. But I know there's times I can just walk through a situation and go, man, I was oblivious to what you wanted to do there, Lord. And the Lord wanted to do a whole bunch of things, but I wasn't zealous. So um, the second thing, number two, regarding the church, we have a desire to protect the word of God, the right standing, the, the truth of God. We become protectors of that within the church that it doesn't get thwarted or, or um, uh, uh, perverted or, you know, sin and wickedness begins to just be at home within the body of Christ, not only in our lives, but even in those that we love. We'll go to those we love and say, man, I'm, I'm praying for you, but man, I'm worried about you. Here's what's going on, and I, I'm just praying for you that you would turn back to the Lord, and then I can see, you know, you're drifting away into these areas of sin, and you want to call them to repentance, and, um, and then you're willing to even call out sin. Sometimes we're just not even willing to do that. We're so apathetic. We just, we just see it and watch it, and we don't even do anything about it. It doesn't stir us enough to say, man, God, your church, we don't want to be openly rebellious. Now, let me make sure I'm, I'm explaining this. Because within the church, it's a, we're sinners. We're sinful. 
We're less than perfect every day. And I'm not talking about the person who goes, man, I, you know, I sinned against the Lord. I mean, I, just want, I need, you know, I'm repenting. I'm, I've repented of that. And I just really want the Lord to help me to walk through this area of my life. I'm not talking about that person. I'm talking about the person who's just defiant in their sin. And they're really, they're really happy with it. And they're willing to parade it in the church. And it becomes a thing where you're just almost uncomfortable with them when you, you know, they begin to talk. It's like, hey, I don't want to hear you talk like that. You, you said you're a believer. Why are you talking about that stuff? You know? So it's that kind of uh, zeal that the Lord needs to give us to say, listen, I don't want to hear you tell another dirty joke. I mean, if you say you're a believer, why are you talking like that? You know, uh, you're my friend or whatever it is. I've known you a long time. But if you're, if you're a believer, then, man, your, your mouth needs to be used for the Lord and, and not for that. You know, whatever it is. I mean, we can do it in a great way, a loving way, confrontive way um, that uh, we do this. But I think those two things is exact thing that the Lord says, I want people zealous and um, they see my heart and they know what grieves me and they're grieved too. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Verse 14, now the, the name of the slain man of Israel who was slain, they're going to name him. Okay, he didn't get away. With, your name's going down in the Bible, right? With the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Sula. Your family's going to be in charge, you know, or at least brought into this. A leader of a father's household among the Simeonites, who so goes all the way to your tribe. The name of the Midianite woman who was slain was Cosby. Now, she's not even a uh, thing of Israel, but they name him uh, her too. The daughter of Zur, her father, who was head of the people of a father's household in Midian. So she's te- technically a Midianite. In the, in the land of Moab. Moab. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, be hostile to the Midianites and strike them. For they have been hostile to you with their tricks with which they have deceived you in the affair of Peor and in the affair of Cosby, this, this woman, the daughter of the leader of Midian, who, their sister who was slain on the day of the plague because of Peor. And he keeps mentioning Peor, Peor, this worship of Baal in Peor and uh, what's been going on. Now, if we, and you would never know this, if you read the New Testament for the rest of your life, you never read the Old Testament, whenever you hear, hear the word Balaam, the man Balaam, you would never know what that means. You could study the context in the context of the New Testament, and you would never figure out what it means each time you see ba- uh, uh, Balaam mentioned. And he's mentioned in Jude and in Revelation in some really specific context there. And uh, this is the only way we can see what really happened and has gone on here because this was a planned, strategized attack against Israel. It didn't just happen. It was planned. Who planned it? Who gave the information there that they could uh, do this to Israel? Our good old boy, Balaam. Last time we saw him, he was like, well, I I, I refuse to curse Israel because God only wants to bless them. And I'm not taking, I don't care if you offer me the, all your money, all your gold. I'm going home. He didn't stay home. He came back. He might not have ever personally cursed Israel, but what he did was he showed Balak how they could, they could defy, draw them in, entice them into sin so God would judge them and would curse them. He planned this. He strategized this. And so in the book of Revelation, it says, but I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, a church in the, new, in the book of Revelation of the seven churches, one of those churches, Pergamos, he is judging them. And he's saying, listen, you got the teaching of Balaam in your church. And he says, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat the sacrifice, things sacrificed to idols, and to commit the acts of immorality. That was his strategy. And now... He says, you got somebody in your church who is, who is feeding people, discipling people in ways to be rebellious to the Lord within the church. 
and to go into areas of sin, of adultery and of false worship within the church. And you'd never pick up on all of that if you didn't know this story. So see, you had to study numbers. You didn't want to study numbers, but you had to study numbers because you wanted to know all the counsel of God. And so he gave us that wisdom there. But you see it that way. In Jude 10 and 11, it says, but these men revile the things which they do not understand. They're, they're just arrogant. These are men that have come into the church as well, false teachers. And they revile the things which they do not understand. They're, not even, they're ignorant of the truth of the Lord. And the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning uh, animals, it says, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. God told him specifically about his sin there, but he killed his brother uh, anyway. And it says, um, for pay, for pay, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam for the pursuit of riches. And that's what Balaam was getting. He was getting paid for it. The love of money led him to defy the very God. He was a prophet of God. God spoke to him, but he turned there and he became again a, a, a counselor to the prophet of Baal. And I, I don't believe he died. Uh, I believe he died cursed by God. Um, and and he, he perished, it says, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And as you see here um, um, in Numbers 31, we're going to see it in a, a week or so, um, that he had moved out of his land, and he moved over into the land of Mo the Moabites because that's where he died. And later on, when God judges them, one of the first people they're going to kill is Balaam. They're going to strike him down. He'll die right there in his own, in his own sin, in his own sinfulness there. And um, it, it, the Bible says he'll, he'll de uh, um, not only die there, but um, he had been become a wealthy man in the middle of all of that. So... That's the lesson of Balaam, and again, um, it's a lesson for us when we think of Balaam because it's attack against the church. In the New Testament, we see that spirit of Balaam are those who are coming in to try to undermine the church to get it to be in rebellion against the Lord. You say, well, did anybody do that in the church? Read the New Testament. People are always trying to come into the church launch the church off into other sins. And we've seen the church go into all kinds of sins, open defiance against God. And I'm not saying the true church of Christ, the true believers, but within churches, you see some of them become utterly corrupt and the wickedness that they do uh, within them. And so we see it all the time. Chapter 26. Then it it came about after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and to Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel from 20 years old and upward by their father's households, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel. So Moses and Eleazar, the priest, spoke with them in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, take a census of the people from 20 years old and upward as the Lord has commanded Moses. Now, the, the, we started out not too long as they began to come into the land that they took the census. So at the beginning of this whole journey, they took a census. But those numbers are no good anymore because now they had to go back away from the, they didn't enter in and they went back out into the wilderness and remember God said, I'm gonna kill all of that generation who would not trust me. You will die in the desert. So a lot of people have been dying. That whole generation has died off. And so now he's saying, listen, you need to count again. Count everything again. And so this is census number two. That's why they call it numbers. You know, it begins with the numbers, ends with the numbers. And so now they got to get the numbers again. And uh, because a lot has happened in these really about 38 years. So verse uh, uh, the end of verse 4. Now the sons of Israel who came out of the land of Egypt were, and I'm, we won't read all of them, but we'll read the first one here, Reuben, Israel's firstborn, the son of Reuben, and he begins to list his family, descendants back um, are toward uh, this time that they live in now, of Hezron, the family of the Hezronites, 
of Camry, the family of the Carm, uh, Carmites. These are the families of the Reubenites, and those who were numbered of them were 43,730. So it goes back again, and again, the names, some of the names have changed at the end of the line because the fathers are already dead, and now uh, the leadership has changed as well. And, but he says, listen, of all the people who spread out from Reuben, you know, the, one of the 12 sons, all of these families are named. The heads of the families are named. They got 43,000 men that are 20 years old or older, able to go out to war. Then he says, the son of Palu, Eliab, and he, and he, he wants to, to mention here a Simeonite. And because he's recounting that one of them, some of them have died from the Simeon's tribe because they tested the Lord. And so the sons of Eliab, Nemuel, Dathan, and Abram, these are the, uh, the Dathan and the, uh, and it, these are the same Dathan and Abram who were called by the congregation, who contended, they were leaders, who contended against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah. Korah was in the middle of a rebellion. Some of the leaders said, we're going to rebel with him. We also think uh, Mo uh, Moses shouldn't be the one in authority that um, he, we should be able to lead as well. Then they contended against the Lord, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, uh, along with Korah, when that company died, uh, when the fire devoured 250 men, so that they became a warring. The sons of Korah, however, did not die. And so um, he says, listen, they, they're missing some of their people now. But he goes through, names the rest of Simeon 12 uh, and 13, and he says they only have 22,200. So let's move all the way down to verse 51. He says, these are those who were numbered of the sons of Israel, 601,730 men that are 20 years old or are, are, are older. They have a force, a fighting force of 601,730. How many of that 601,730 does God need to defeat his enemies? Zero. This has nothing to do with their ability to go into the land. This is more of a reminder of this other thing here is that at the first census, you had 603,550. You're 2,000 down, and you had 40 years to reproduce more of a generation. That's how many, uh, in the sense that you're, you're, you're worse off than you were before after the 40 years. Um, and we were basically, you're almost the same as you were before. And so that's how many had died in uh, uh, the desert there after 38 years. Verse 52, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, among these, the land shall be divided for an inheritance. Pay attention to this. According to the number of names. So there's going to be an allotted areas that they're going to be given but they're going to be given in relation to the size of the tribe. And so the bigger the tribe, the more land that you get. And so it's, you know, in a sense, an equality. If you only have 20,000, you don't need the land of the space of what 40,000 men would need. And so he's beginning to look at that regarding their names. To the larger group, you shall increase their inheritance. And to the smaller group, you shall diminish their inheritance. Each shall be given their inheritance according to those who were numbered of them. So they're getting ready to give a, a, a division here uh, of the land. But the land shall be divided by lot. They shall receive their inheritance according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. So God's already got a strategic design who gets what portion, and, and he'll do it by lot. According to the selection by lot, their inheritance shall be divided between the larger and the smaller groups. And so... Um, Again, they'll, they'll portion that area in a way of making the one next to it a little bit bigger and, uh, until it fits the size of the, of the um, people. Now, verse 57. These are those who were numbered of the Levites according to their families, of Gershom, the family of the Gershonites, of Kohath, the family of the Kohathites, and for Merari, the family of the Merarites. Now, again, the Levites don't get a portion no land. 
their portion is to be in the presence of the Lord and to take care of the house of the Lord. So wherever they are in the land, they're not going to own that land. But like I said, they'll have an inheritance because they're going to, we already know, they're going to get a tenth of all of the tithe that comes in. And it's actually going to end up where they're going to have really more of the blessings of everybody else's blessing. They get the best of everybody's blessing because everybody who's there gives the, the best of their 10%, the best they give to the Lord as an offering. And out of that, they get a percentage of that. And so when you take all of the 12 tribes, you're actually getting what? 12%, you know, are really 120% when you figure that out there. So, and that's the best. And so um, really God says, no, no, it's better to be close to me um, overall because you get my leftovers, <laughs> and um, which is only the best. Now, um, so if you read, go down to verse uh, 62, those who were numbered of them were 23,000, every male from a month old and up. So they didn't need to be fighting. They were in by birth. And so it, if you're a month old or more, then you counted them. So they had 23,000 um, of those that were in the tribes of Levites. And by the way, those three families um, were used here. And he goes back and explains Aaron and his sons, Nadab and Abihu, and how they were killed. And now it's Eliezer and Ithamar and kind of explains how that's divided up. Verse 63, these are those who were numbered by Moses and Eliezer the priest who numbered the sons of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan um, at Jericho. But among these, there was not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest who numbered the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. What does that mean? It means there wasn't one person who tallied, okay, um, that is around still to tally this time, okay? He says, for the Lord had said of them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And not a man was left of them except Caleb, the son of Je uh, Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So all 10 of those spies who were there and their leadership, all of them were gone and they passed away in the desert because God promised they would. But Caleb and Joshua, this is what's amazing. 38 years later, they're still on fire for God. And we're going to watch them as they go in. I love both of those guys. They're, they're a couple of guys in the Bible that I just go, I would like to be like those guys. And he said that he gave them strength. I mean, they had the same strength as when they, 38 years ago. And uh, all the way up until their death, he's going to make them strong to, to accomplish his will. And so we'll see as they go in. Um, they're, they're studs for the Lord, man. I mean, they are faith guys. There's nothing that intimidates them. If God said it, we're going to get it. And if God promised it, it's ours. And uh, man, I just like that mentality. Don't worry, it'll go quick. Chapter 27. Then the daughters of Zelophehad, and the son of Hefner, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph came near, and these are the names of his daughters. Now, they're going to explain something here, and he takes the time to do this. Uh, their names are um, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Terza, okay? Five daughters. They stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the leaders and all the congregation at the doorway of the tent of meeting saying, our father died in the wilderness. Yet he was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but he died in his own sin and had no sons. So they are five daughters who had a father who died. Like God said, you will perish in the desert. But they weren't cursing God. They weren't defiant against God like the people of Korah. They weren't caught up in one of those things uh, there. And, they, and so they're saying, um, 
Why should, verse 4, the name of our father be withdrawn from among his family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord. He asked wisdom from the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, the daughters of Zelophad are right in their statements. You shall surely give them a hereditary possession among their father's brothers. Go to their brothers then and uh, and let their brothers secure this land for them, and you shall transfer the inheritance of their father to them. So, uh, further, you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, let's apply this now to everybody in Israel. If a man dies and has no son, then you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brother, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his nearest relative in his own family, and he shall possess it, and it shall be a statutory ordinance to the sons of Israel, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So he said, I want to make sure everybody gets their inheritance, whether or not you're a man or you, your father who has died only had daughters. So really, here's the thing. They want to make sure their name got on the list. So that that would continue to expand the land, right, that they got, because every name was on the list expanded the land. And that land could be given then to the brothers, and and it would be in memorial to that father. And so his name would be passed along, and that land would be passed along. Even though the brothers are occupying that land, or the daughters would occupy it until they married and joined their husbands, and uh, but it would be kept, and it was a way to be fair, uh, for those who uh, God had promised an inheritance. Verse 12, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up to this mountain of Abarim and see the land which I have given to the sons of Israel. Let's take a walk. Hmm. Moses knows it's coming. He knows he's going to be taking a walk with God. And when you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as Aaron, your brother, was. For in the wilderness of Zin, during the strife of the congregation, you rebelled against my command to treat me as holy before their eyes at the water. And these are the waters of Meribah at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. And so the Moses, here's, here's Moses' reply. Then Moses spoke to the Lord saying, May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation. Moses didn't complain about the judgment. He accepted it from God. He knew his, that he had sinned against the Lord. And, he, you know, this wasn't a, a curse unto hell. This was a gathering for him. The spirit part of it here doesn't mean I'll be gathered to the other spirits that are there. Um, yes, he will be gathered to his father's God has a place for those uh, who stand in faith with him. Obviously, an eternal uh, um, life which is great. He knew he was the Lord's and he was going to continue to be the Lord even though he died. But that's not what he means there by spirits. People misuse this thing saying that sometimes they say, you know, men are spirits before they come into the earth. And, you know, the Mormon church uses that a lot and uh, tries to say, you know, the spirit already existed and now it's given a body. It's not what it's saying. It's just saying this because we'll see. God, you know every spirit That's in every man. You know the heart of every man. Only you know the heart of every man. And here's what he wanted. God, find a man that has a heart after you to shepherd these people. That's what he was thinking about. Who's going to take care of these people? God, do you have the right guy? Choose a, a man that will honor you and serve you. This, this man was incredible. Verse 17 says, who will go out and come in before them? Uh, a man that will go out and come in before them and who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherd. That's the humility and the goodness uh, uh, of Moses. He was concerned about Israel to his, to his last breath. And he loved the, um, the people, even in their sinfulness and their rebellion. There were many who were obedient to the Lord. But he said, Lord, they're going to need a shepherd. 
And uh, this, this, is a, this, is, this passage will teach us something that's important about leadership. And I don't think there's uh, another way to really see this. A lot of people misinterpret this section here um, as, as the baton is passed, passed you know, from Moses to Joshua. And this, this section really explains it um, um, more to us. Um, I do not believe that the, um, I believe God puts shepherds over his church. I believe in that. And the New Testament backs that up. That, that a, a church should have a, a, an elder or a shepherd or maybe several shepherds, but he wants to have that leadership over his church. But it isn't the Moses model, okay? We're going to see a distinction between the two, and we're going to see that God makes the distinction between the two because there's been times in the church where churches, they called it the shepherding movement a long time ago, if you're old enough, you've been around, that these men kind of got into a place of like this ultimate authority over the church. Like they're above the church and they're the ones who speak for God. And, uh, you know, when you got to make a decision, you need to come to them and they'll tell you if you should make that decision and, you know, which car to buy and when you should buy a house and who you should marry. And the church actually bought into that. Can you imagine letting this guy do that? No man has that authority. Only God has that authority. Yes, they should lead you, but it's very important how they lead you. Paul said this in Acts 20. He said, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Oh, let me go to verse 29. Uh, I think that's it here. Yeah, okay. I got that. Uh, The whole purpose of God. In other words, I taught to you all the word of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. He's speaking to the elders of the churches in the area of Ephesus, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That's, that's your job. You better be a good shepherd. Okay? And he goes on. It's one of my... Oh, that's not it. Oh, here we go. I love this passage. He says... For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. You need to protect them. You need to stand there. You need to stand in the word of God and hold to the word of God. And that's what God wants to have over his church not somebody who's above them, but somebody who stands with them and stands in the word of God and speaks for the word of God. And he doesn't want them to shrink back from holding that line. And that's what I believe God calls men to in regarding uh, shepherding his church. Let's go to verse 18. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit. I know his spirit. I know all the spirits of man. And he says, a man in whom is the spirit, he has the spirit of God in him. Lay, lay your hand on him and have him stand before Eliezer, the priest, and before all the congregation and commission him in their sight. You shall put some of your authority on him. You shall put all of your authority on him. Does it say all? Okay. You shall put some of your authority on him in order that all the congregation of the sons of Israel may obey him. He would become the shepherd of Israel, but not like Moses. You see, there's a difference between the two. What's the difference? Moses spoke for God. When he spoke, God spoke. When he said, God said, then it was God speaking. That's not going to happen for Joshua. In fact, he says here, verse 21, Moreover, he shall stand before Eliezer, the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim and and the Thummim, I think, before the Lord. At his command, they shall go out, and at his command, they shall come in, both he and the sons of Israel with him, even all the congregation. He's saying, listen, I'm going to put another voice in the middle there. He is not the one who speaks directly for God. He has to go before the high priest and then I'll speak to the high priest, he said, through the Urim. Now, this was a, you know, they carried the little stones, the white and the black stone there inside the priestly garment. 
and there was a way that you could seek the Lord. Lord, are you with us on this? Lord, are you going to go with us in battle? And they could draw the white or the black stone, and they could determine the, the voice of the Lord. But it was out of Joshua's hands. Why? So Joshua couldn't say, you know, thus saith the Lord, do this. I'm, I'm the voice of God. He wasn't going to be the voice of God. The same thing today. A pastor can't say, you know, thus saith the Lord, and I've heard from God. No. The pastor has to go to the word of God. That's the authority. It's above him. That's the authority. And he's submitted the same way under the authority of God. So he can't use his position to thunder down these things. I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you, but it's pretty, if you have, you remember it, that somebody came up to you and they said they had a word from God for you, right? I mean, it's just like they're going to share this word of God. And in my experience, maybe one out of 20 is from God. Maybe, maybe more than that, but it could be from God. It could not be from God, but they say, you know, I've heard from God. And so they're kind of cutting out the middleman and they're saying, you're hearing God right now. And then it uh, could, it could be something like, you are to marry this, that person right there. God told me you were going to marry that person. It's like, really? Because you've said that now, I'm, I'm like under obligation now. How could I refuse that if God said I got to marry that person, right? That's crazy. Um, Listen, you're under no obligation to let somebody tell you what God has said. You tell them that you're going to obey only what God speaks when God speaks the same thing to you. There needs to be a confirmation. The word of God has to back that up and it has to be right in God's word. Or God has to speak that to you. Because a word should always be a confirmation of what God has spoken, not not, uh, trusting uh, their word there. God needs to speak. So no man gets to be God, right? Verse 22, Moses did just as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation. Then he laid his hands on him and he commissioned him just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Now, what an amazing um, um, way to see this. Um, when we ordain pastors here, we do, not, um, we do not pray for them that God would make them a man of God and God would equip them to do the work of the ministry. The ordination is when we lay hands on somebody because we've already seen the hand of God on them. He's already done the work. We're confirming what God has done. You don't want to anoint somebody like we're hoping he'll be a man of God. No, you already want to see that he's a man of God. And you want to now confirm that by the laying on of hands. He just wanted everybody else to see by the laying on of hands, all of Israel to see Joshua is your man. And they watched Moses put his hands on him as well. And he got the authority to be a leader there. We are not going to finish... um, chapter 28, but I just want to let you know that as you read through chapter 28 tonight, it's really a reiteration of a lot of the same sacrifices that the Lord had instituted here. You know, he'll tell them, all right, you're going to sacrifice two lambs every day, one in the morning, one in the night, at nighttime. Once a month, you're going to, you know, sacrifice a bull, two rams, seven lambs, you know, and then for the special feast, you're going to do this. And he'll go back over and reiterate all of that. That's pretty much the chapter, uh, chapter 28. That's the fastest chapter you've ever done in the history of Through the Bible. Well, we got to because we're out of time tonight. Let's bow our heads and pray together. A lot of great lessons, Lord. We learned lessons from that young man who just strolled down the avenue in his sin and is in a defiant heart and um, not realizing your judgment was going to fall upon him. He couldn't mock you openly. And we see a world, Lord, around us just feels at liberty to mock you every day. Nations that mock you, turn from you. You said they know you. They know better than to do that, but they do it anyway. 
And they even invite others into their own sin. And that's, that's our world, Lord. But tonight we're reminded that we need to be a Phineas, to have a passion for you that is a heart, Lord, that we care about those that are perishing and uh, that you're the only one that could ignite that fire. We want to have your heart. We want to have your eyes. And I pray, Father, that you would ignite our heart that way. And then also within the church, not only for our lives, Lord, we shouldn't ever flaunt our sin. We should be repentant of our sin. And then also, Lord, to want to see your church be holy and right and true so we can be a great light to the world. It's a lot of great truths here. Lord, we remember Balaam as well on the way out tonight. Um, people can come into the church like wolves and, and they're there and they know what they're doing, but they're, they know they're corrupting and they're willing to do it for dishonest gain to fleece the church and so we should be aware, Lord, um, of all of these things and make them as lessons, Lord, for us. And uh, we pray for that. We pray for the shepherds, Lord, of the sheep. And we pray for the sheep, Lord, that are in your church, that uh, you would keep us, keep us strong, keep us passionate until you take us home. We love you tonight, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.